everyone for this lecture we're going to be covering the cell junctions we have three main general types which are tight junctions anchoring junctions and gap junctions within the anchoring junctions there are three types desmosomes hemidesmosomes and adherence junctions before we get started into the different types of cell junctions I think it's important for us to talk about the different components of the cytoskeleton, mainly because I don't cover the cell chapter. So the cytoskeleton is going to form this complex thread-like network throughout the cell, which is going to consist of three different kinds of protein-based filaments, which are the microtubules, the microfilaments, and the intermediate filaments. Even though both microtubules and microfilaments start with micro, which means small, a tube is going to be bigger than a filament. So the microtubules is going to be the thickest of the three filaments, which is going to be made up of this hollow tube that's composed primarily of protein units that's called tubulin. These filaments, they help provide support and structure to the cytoplasm of the cell. They're also involved in cell division and in transport of intracellular materials. Microtubules also make up two types of cellular appendages that are going to be important for motion, which are the cilia and the flagella, which we will discuss more on the next slide. In contrast with microtubules, microfilaments is going to be a thinner type of cytoskeleton filament. The primary component of these filament is actin, which is a protein that forms these chain-like structures, as you can see right over here on the image. Actin fibers, which are twisted chains of actin filaments, they're going to constitute a large component of muscle tissue, and along with a protein that's called myosin, they're going to be responsible for muscle contraction. So there's going to be a coupling between the actin filaments and the myosin to promote this muscle contraction. Besides muscle contraction, actin is also going to have this important role during cell division. When a cell is about to split in half during the cell division, these actin filaments are going to work also with myosin to create like a cleavage or a groove that eventually will split the cell down the middle and it's going to form two new cells from the original cell. The final cytoskeleton filament is going to be the intermediate filament. As the name suggests, an intermediate filament is a filament intermediate in thickness between the microtubules and the microfilaments. These intermediate filaments they're made up of these long fibrous subunits of a protein that's called keratin that are going to bound together like a thread to compose a rope-like structure, as you see right over here. Intermediate filaments together with microtubules, they're going to be important for maintaining the cell shape and the structure of the cells. Unlike the microtubules, which are more resistant to compression, intermediate filaments, they resist tension, which are the forces that pull the cells apart. So there's always certain types of tensions that are trying to pull the cells apart, and the intermediate filaments are there to hold these cells together. Therefore, they're going to be the main component of cell junctions, which are going to keep these cells together. To summarize then, we can say that the intermediate filaments are going to be important for cell junction, which is what we're going to cover in this learning outcome. And the other two types of cytoskeleton components, which are the microtubules and the microfilaments, are going to be important for these plasma membrane extensions, which are the cilia, the flagellum, and the microvilli, which we are covering on the next slide. I think it's very important for us to cover these plasma membrane extensions because the cilia and the microvilli are going to be an extension of epithelial cells. And since this module 
is covering epithelial cells, I think it's important for us to touch on these terms and structures so that you know exactly where they're coming from. From the previous slide, we already know what microtubules are and microfilaments. Microtubules form by tubulin, microfilament form by actin filaments. So as you can see here, two structures, the cilia and the flagellum, are going to be formed by microtubules and microvilli are going to be formed by microfilaments. The cilia are going to be found on many body cells, including epithelial cells that are going to line the airways of the respiratory system. We can see right over here how they are presented. Cilia basically means hair. So these cilia, they're going to move or we say that they're going to beat rhythmically in a way that they're constantly moving waste materials such as dust or mucus or even bacteria that might enter your airways. And they do this to try to get these materials away from the lungs and towards the mouth. As you can imagine, if bacteria gets into the lungs, it's going to give you an infection of your lungs, which is mostly called pneumonia. So you want to make sure that the cilia are beating in a way that they're trying to take away the foreign objects from your lungs. Another example of cilia are the cilia that beat on cells in the female fallopian tubes to move the egg cells from the ovary towards the uterus where they will be fertilized. Next, we have the flagellum. The flagellum is going to be an appendage that's going to be way larger than the cilium, and we can see it right over here compared to the cilia, which are shorter, and they're going to be specialized for cell locomotion. The only flagellated cells in humans are the sperm cells that must propel themselves towards the female egg to fertilize it. And we can see right over here on this image all the sperms with their long tail or long flagellum right over there. So again, the flagellum and the cilia are made up of microtubules. And now we're going to talk about the microvilli, which is made up of microfilaments. So micro means small, villi are extensions. And the microvilli, they're going to be present mainly in areas where we want to have more absorption or more secretion. So it's going to increase the surface area. As you can see, by having these membrane extensions right over here, you're going to be increasing the surface area, and therefore you're going to increase what can be absorbed and what can be secreted. Now that we have covered cytoskeleton components, which are the microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments, and the plasma membrane extensions, which are the cilia, the flagellum, and the microvilli, I think it's going to be a little bit easier for you to understand how cell junctions work in a way to keep the cells together. Like I said, cell junctions are these structures that will, for most part, keep the epithelial cells together. They do that in a way that there is actually little or no space in between the epithelial cells, meaning that the cells of the epithelia are closely connected they're not going to be separated by intracellular material. There are three basic types of connections that allow varying degrees of interaction between the cells, the tight junctions, the anchoring junctions, and the gap junctions. At one end of the spectrum, we have the tight junctions. You can see on this image where they're going to be located within adjacent cells. These type junctions, they will separate the cells into what we call an apical portion, which is the top portion, and a basal portion, which is the bottom portion, because they really squeeze the membranes from adjacent cells. In other words, when the two adjacent epithelial cells form a tight junction, there is no extracellular space between them and there is no movement of substances through this extracellular space. 
So this is why we can say that the tight junction separates the cells into what we call an apical portion, which is a top portion, and a basal portion, which is the bottom portion. This allows the epithelia to act as this selective barrier, preventing anything from traveling from one cell to the other. Now these tight junctions, they're formed by these web-like strands of transmembrane proteins, which are proteins that crosses the cell membrane from the external environment into the cell, so inside of the cell. Next, we have the anchoring junctions, which include several types of cell junctions that help to stabilize these epithelial tissues as anchor means to hold in place. So anchoring junctions, they're going to be common on the lateral sides of the epithelial tissue and also on the basal part of the epithelial tissues where they are going to provide a strong and flexible connection between the cells. There are three types of anchoring junctions. We have what we call the desmosomes, the hemidesmosomes, and the adherence junctions. The desmosomes are going to contain these patch-like structures, which are also called plaques, Exiting from the plague, we're going to have the intermediate filaments, which we talked about already, which is made of keratin. And between the plagues, we're going to have the transmembrane glycoproteins that are going to be the ones that will hold the two adjacent membranes together. In this case, this protein is cadrin. Now we go down to the hemidesmosomes. Hemi means half, so that's why it's called hemidesmosome, because it looks like half of a desmosome. These cell junctions, instead of attaching the membrane of adjacent cells, it's going to attach the basal part of the membrane of an epithelial cell to the basal lamina. While hemidesmosomes are similar in appearance to desmosomes, they include the adhesion protein that's called integrin, instead of having cadrins like the desmosomes. Next, we have the adherence junctions. These are going to use either cadrins or integrins depending on where they are attaching within the epithelial tissue. If they're attaching, in this case, to adjacent plasma membranes, you're going to have cadrins. As you can see over here in this image, that's what they're representing, that they're attaching adjacent cell membranes. If they were attaching down here to the plasma membrane, you would have an integrin instead of a cadrin. The other difference between the adherence junctions and the desmosomes is that here we see the presence of actin filament instead of intermediate filament. As we talked about, actin is also found in muscle cells and they will help with muscle contraction. Now here on epithelial tissue, actin can connect these isolated patches or actually form a belt-like structure as we can see right over here inside the cell. And these junctions, they are going to influence the shape and folding of the epithelial tissue. In contrast with the tight and anchoring junctions, the gap junctions, like the name suggests, they're going to form this intercellular passageway or a gap between the membranes of adjacent cells to facilitate the movement of small molecules and ions between the cytoplasm of these adjacent cells. These junctions, they are going to allow electrical and metabolic coupling of adjacent cells, which coordinates the function in large group cells. So because these cells are all closely together with little or no space, they're able to coordinate the function of large groups of cells. These gap junctions, they're gonna be formed by these structures that are called connexons. And what forms the connexons are these proteins that are called connexins. For me, it makes it easier to remember connexons and connexins because it's sort of like connecting and that's what gap junctions do. They connect one cell to another in a way that there can be communication between the cells.